hope you all enjoyed that as much as I did. I'm Angelo Guisado, and I'm honoring to moderate this panel in this powerful, moving, and very necessary documentary. We, I mean, uh, the Center for Constitutional Rights, bring you this film and talk back as a part of our Freedom Flicks series, where we try to use the power of film to educate, inspire, and build community. I've remarked that this film was particularly necessary now during Black History Month, not only to educate those who may need a particular refresher, um, but to uplift and reflect upon uh, what we regard as a, a ubiquity of Black rage in this country. As James Baldwin once said, to be Black and conscious in America is to be in a constant state of rage. Why are we enraged? Well, if I gave you a full list of the very personal reasons why I'm enraged, we'd be here all night, uh, and we don't have all night. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce um, our panelists. Vincent Warren is the executive director at the Center for Constitutional Rights. He is a leading expert on racial injustice and discriminatory policing. Jeffrey Robinson is the founder and CEO of the Who We Are Project. He is a writer, a producer, and the narrator of the documentary we just watched. Sarah Kunstler and Emily Kunstler are the founders of Off Center Media, a documentary production company dedicated to racial justice and social change. They produced, directed, and edited the film. I'm Angelo Guisado, I'm your moderator and host, and I'm a staff attorney at the Center for Constitutional Rights. Before we get started, I'd like to just acknowledge and thank uh, that to ensure a accessible and inclusive conversation, we're happy to have simultaneous uh, ASL interpretation as well, of as well as live transcription. Now to the film. One overarching theme of the documentary is the importance of capturing an accurate description of our history, particularly with respect to the foundational nature of white supremacy in this country. Critical race theory aims to achieve and educate on the subject, but it's no surprise we've seen an increasing prohibition on the teaching of critical race theory in this country. Why is that so alarming, both as a matter of pedagogy and as a reflection of where society stands today? How does the film respond to the current moment? Why now? Well, I guess I'll start and say it's not now. This film could have come out at any time in the past three years, and it would have been just as timely. In 2020, I wanted this film to come out. In 2021, I wanted it to come out. And January of 2022 was <clears throat> kind of the earliest date that we could get the film, the film there. So uh, we filmed this presentation uh, on Juneteenth, 2018. The term critical race theory wasn't even broadly known at that time, but Texas was passing laws telling its educators, you need to teach that slavery was a secondary issue to the Civil War. So people are looking at the backlash against critical race theory as something new, and it's not. This is just, uh, as, as Yogi Berra, the Yankee catcher would have said, this is just deja vu all over again, because many people will say the South lost the war, but they won the peace. And they won the peace because they rewrote the entire history of what the Civil War was about. And as we have gone forward since 1865, we have a history that has been homogenized, has been edited, and has been shaped to meet a creation story that is beautiful and wrapped in freedom and equality. And like virtually every creation story that exists, uh, there's a whole lot of myth to that. So I don't think, I think, I don't think that, at least for me, making this movie to come out now was not the plan. Um, if this movie, like I said, came out a couple of years ago, it would have been just as timely. And sadly, if it came out a year from now, it would probably be just as timely. Sarah, 
Sarah and Emily. Sure. I mean, you asked, or one of the questions you asked is why the increasing prohibition of critical race theory is so alarming. And, you know, critical race theory, right, is a is not what this is about. Critical race theory is a term that's been co-opted and, and, and is using as a, 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 a umbrella to really talk about any history of this country that has to do with the experience of black Americans in this country. That, 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 that is now what's known as critical race theory. Critical race theory originally was a theory that university scholars, first uh, law professors, and then uh, other, other branches of academia to explore race and racism in society and institutions. Um, but it's, it's been adopted in this fight for what we can teach our children because it's a term that sounds scary. Um, and it's alarming because in a democracy, ours included, an educated citizenry is what's necessary for our survival as a free people. We need to talk together about important choices before we reach decisions. We need information in order to have those conversations. So if we're to have, if there's such a thing as a common good of a community or a nation, we need to have this knowledge in order for our democracy to survive. So that's, that's what's at stake here. And that's what's so alarming about these prohibitions. And can I add one thing? Um, I just react because when you say alarming, there's a, a sense that it's like, oh my God, it's this new thing. This is nothing new. This is, there's a reason that so many Americans never heard of the Tulsa massacre until an HBO series called Watchmen came out. That was literally erased from our collective consciousness. So the erasure of the truth about our history is not a new element that, that is like, you know, just come up right now. This is just a continuation of what, always, what has always happened and what people are seeing. The reason people are getting alarmed now is that they are seeing that the truth is making a comeback and they're trying to cut it off as quickly as they can. I love the fact that the truth is making a comeback. I think that's exactly right. And, you know, and before actually before I start, I just wanted to, um, to thank you all for being here and also to just acknowledge uh, that Sarah and Emily, in addition to being outstanding filmmakers and wonderful human beings, are also the daughters of uh, CCR's founder, William Kunstler, for, for people watching that don't know. So we are coming full circle, which makes me happy. And I can't help but thinking he would be smiling at us from wherever it is one smiles from uh, when wonderful things happen. <laughs> and um, But I also think, like, look, this film could not come too early and it also could not come too late precisely for the reasons that you all are laying out. And I think alarm is actually a, a really good word because there is something alarming about the fact that we are alarmed about things that have happened, um, that have been happening for hundreds of years. That's, that's revelatory. And I think folks, black and white, myself included, learned things from this film and from your research, Jeffrey, that we just didn't know that had been shielded from us, that had been uh, hidden from us. And, um, you know, and I think that what is remarkable about the way the story is being told now is that it lays it all out for people to reckon with. And it's shocking to me that, but not surprising, <clears throat> That I mean, how many years have we been collectively having a discussion about race, not knowing so many of the things that are in this film, or with people that don't know half the stuff that we know? What kind of conversation is that? You know, as as Sarah was pointing out. So I, I think that you know the critical race theory element is important because, as was pointed out, that this is another uh, example of distortion. And you know, you only have to go back to um, the, the line that's drawn from the days of slavery when it was illegal for Black people to be educated to the, to the line now where it's becoming illegal for Black people to educate other people and white people. Uh, that's the line that's being drawn. And I think that's, the, that's where this 
wonderful story sits in that trajectory. One thing you couldn't do as an enslaved person was let your quote unquote owner know that you knew how to read because that was the quickest way, one of the quickest ways to get killed. Because if you know how to read, you can teach somebody else to read and that's dangerous. And education really is the most dangerous thing. Uh, my family lore has it that my great, great, great grandmother, Charlotte Romans, then enslaved, taught herself how to read, purchased her own freedom, and then taught her husband how to read, and then bought his freedom. And that's a story uh, from South Carolina, um, where you visited in the film, um, Jeffrey. I was wondering if you could just talk to the audience about personally what it was like to go to these very foundational uh, uh, places in our history and really live that experience? I think uh, each of our trips uh, began with uh, a sense of excitement and, uh, and a respect for what we were trying to accomplish and the folks we hoped would talk to us. At the end of each of our trips, I think all of us thought, well, this was the best trip we could have had. And we just kept saying that. Um, I'll use Charleston as an example because there are many historians that say up to 75% of all Black people in America can trace their beginnings on this continent back to Charleston, South Carolina, because that's how many enslaved people landed there uh, when the transatlantic slave trade was just hopping. And we got there on a Thursday. I gave the presentation that is the backbone of this film. I gave a version of that presentation that was three hours long on Thursday. We went to the Slave Mart Museum and you saw a little bit of that in the film. We went to a plantation and saw how they budgeted to lose certain in, a certain number of enslaved people every year. Gonna have some water moccasins kill them and they're gonna drown and they're gonna have some dysentery. And now you could just plan so that the economic well-being of the plantation would be maintained throughout the life and death of the enslaved people. Uh, we interviewed that gentleman on the waterfront and uh, had that experience. And what was interesting, there are a lot of things interesting about that experience, but one of the things was that when we left there, we went to a demonstration at the John C. Calhoun Monument in downtown Charleston, a monument that you could see standing right in front of the doors of Mother Emanuel Church where Dylan Roof walked in and slaughtered those people. You could see it when we were there, but you can't see it now because it's been taken down. We were at a protest at that monument and the gentleman from the uh, waterfront and his friends showed up and they were taking pictures and they were trying to intimidate us. Uh, and so, you know, these are just some of the things that were going on as we would, you know, go on these trips, but, uh, you know, it didn't make it in the film, but we interviewed the pastor at Mother Emanuel Church. We interviewed one of the parishioners there who told us the history of Charleston, South Carolina, and in particular, Denmark, D.C., an enslaved person who got his freedom and, and tried to lead an incredibly large revolt, but was, you know, put down and he was killed. He was executed. So uh, each of these trips involved going into homes and talking to people who had incredible power, incredibly powerful personal stories. And I think one of the greatest gifts that all of us got in doing this work is the fact that those families chose to, to share their stories with us. But um, each trip had moments where, you know, we would pile into our 15 person van and nobody would say anything. And other times we're piling into the van and you know, there are five or six conversations going on. So uh, it, was, uh, it was a remarkable experience. Thank you for that. Um, you took two trips that I'd like to talk about. One to Memphis, your hometown, and one uh, to New York. The Memphis trip, uh, where the film begins, uh, starts with the tragic assassination of Martin Luther King in 1968. 
everyone, a lot of people know that, not everyone. Most people don't know that Dr. King was there to support the sanitation workers strike uh, as part of a larger movement for economic equality known as the Poor People's Campaign. Putting the Memphis trip just to one side for the moment, uh, I think I'd also like to mention the trip to New York, which taught me uh, that New York actually considered seceding from the Union uh, on the precipice of the Civil War, uh, particularly not to upset um, the economy, uh, citing to uh, the cotton economy uh, and its role in making New York the financial capital uh, of the country. These two trips illustrated that perhaps there's something more, uh, an analysis between race and class, race and capitalism, uh, and how we are to move forward to achieve racial harmony in this country, um, and, and what role and analysis of economic oppression uh, should come with it. I have some thoughts on that, Sarah and Emily. Do you do you want to go, or should I? You can start. Um, money changes everything, and it always has. And so, uh, money was what was behind the transatlantic slave trade. When people see the things in the Constitution about shutting that trade down after 1808, that didn't have I won't say it didn't have anything to do with moral compulsion against slavery, because there were some people talking about that, but the real thing behind that was money going into the pockets of the domestic slave traders, because uh, there were breeding farms here in America where black women were bred to produce children. And the people running those farms did not want the competition that was created by importing enslaved people from Africa. I think, you know, that's one of the ways that money plays a part. And capitalism is also, you know, a critical part of this inquiry. Um, and I think what you see in this film is that that note runs through the film. I didn't start to make a presentation about capitalism. That was not my intent when I started it. My intent was to make a history of what America did to Black people that came here against our will, that were kidnapped and brought here to be enslaved. I wanted to tell the story of American history as opposed to a completely deep analysis of where that history went and what it meant. While there's some of that in the film, it just wasn't what I was trying to do. Having said that, uh, you can see from uh, the things in the film, one point, I can't remember how many million tons of cotton were produced in 1790, and it was 2.3 billion pounds by 1860. That's all about money. When you think about the money that was involved in the practice of redlining and how some communities were economically advantaged and some communities were economically disadvantaged. Elmore Bowling got killed because he was too successful to be a Negro. The Tulsa massacre was about the destruction of wealth. And so you go through all of these things that have happened throughout American history, and there is clearly a tie to money in all of them. And so I agree with you that uh, our capitalist economy is a critical part of understanding why we are where we are. And dealing with the issues of capitalism is clearly important, but I think uh, perhaps not separate for that, from that, but there is, if, if you think about this, it's a story in chapters. And capitalism and money is definitely a significant chapter, but what I wanted to do was have America come face to face with, this is what you did to this group of people. And this is what we as a country did. And I don't care about motivations. Of course, I do care about motivations. But what I was more concerned with was a narrative, a chronicle of racism in America. And I'll just end by saying it is a chronicle, not the chronicle.
because if it was the Chronicle, you'd still be watching the movie because it wouldn't be over yet. We would be talking about brown people, Asian people, all kinds of people who have experienced racism in this country. But I didn't feel like I had the agency to tell that story. And I started doing the research on this story for very personal reasons, things that were happening in my family. So what I was looking for was something to help me figure out how I could help this young kid turn into uh, you know, a, a decent young man. And while that's what I was looking for, what I found was this chronicle of racism. I think just to echo what Jeffrey said is that that economics is entwined with every aspect of this story. You know, you look at the the fingerprints and the bricks in Charleston, South Carolina, and you think about the the free labor, all of the the wealth that was created by enslaved black people in Charleston and all across this country. Um, and and those handprints are a piece of that history that was that could not be erased, despite how desperately uh, we may have tried to erase it as a nation. You know, you look at um, how mortgages were created for the purpose of insuring black bodies, because that was a, a, a major source of wealth. And you think about all of the money that still flows everywhere across this country you know, that has its roots. None of our money is clean, right? It's all blood money in this country mm -hmm. because all of this wealth is, is built on the free labor of enslaved people. Um, you know, we didn't make a film um, explicitly about capitalism and, how, and uh, how, how capitalism powers this system. I would say that uh, that, that capitalist system operates as it always does for the very few at the expense of the many. And that historically, even up to the present day, racism is used to preserve that status quo and to preserve that wealth for the few at the expense of the very many. It's not a capitalist system that benefits most people or most white people. It's, it's a system in which racism is used to get most people in this country to vote and act against their own interests in service of that capitalism. And, you know, that, so it's, it's part of this film. It's definitely uh, a subject, a, a topic that, that we're concerned about and that motivates a lot of our conversation and thinking, but, but it is not um, the, the main, uh, the driving force of, of this film. I'm glad that you that you made the film in the uh, in the way that you did or with the focus that you did, because I think just as Angelo pointed out, it actually raises questions around um, capitalism rather than answering them. And of course, the point of this, this of the discussion is to raise questions, to think about them and then to think about how do we how do we answer it? And um, I I read through the entire film. Um, the question of racial capitalism and um, what, uh, what, who was exploited, how were they exploited, who benefited, who um, was denied, and and how that has happened systematically uh, over over the centuries, over the generations in this country. One, you know, I was recently reading about um, a town called Nicodemus, Kansas, and it was actually there was a mm. Court, um, and um, you know, founded in 1877, black settlement uh, settled one of many uh, settled by uh, freed uh, enslaved people, uh, formerly enslaved people, and um, you know, in addition to getting you know being able to having the benefit, the reward for not being enslaved, uh, having to settle on the crappiest land around, black folks just made it work, raised families, educated them, built churches, the whole thing, the, the Black community and the Black church really ar arose from, um, from, that, from the migration, including folks in, 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 in the middle of the country. And what was interesting about Nicodemus is that I was, there was a report with one of the 
ancestors of some of the settlers in, in Nicodemus. And she said, you know, the whole thing was built around the hope and the expectation that once they built the transnational railways, that it would go through Nicodemus. And when it didn't, um, the town began to die. And I mean, it's an important story to lift up because we might, some of us might get tricked into thinking that there are rational economic explanations for where um, train lines go and where highways go. And yes. it's very easy for us to be able to rationalize that. But when you do the analysis, you'll see that the place that the train lines don't go is in black neighborhoods. And the places that the interstates do go is in black neighborhoods. And that happens for a reason. And it's, it's about ensuring that black wealth, black thriving, even beyond money, is um, is oppressed and it doesn't take hold. Um, and I think you know there's so many stories um, that stem from this film and from from reading in history that really implicate um, what what has been happening across this timeline and how it manifests today. When you read about the expressway system in Oakland, California, they essentially surrounded the black community with expressway exits and on ramps and destroyed it. And when you look at that expressway system and you look at that area, it's like, oh my God. But it's like you say, you have to understand that history to look at it and say, oh my God, look at what they did. And we heard from the Tulsa activists that one of the reasons the expressway through Tulsa is where it is is because they probably wanted to cover up some of the mass graves. Yeah, ex exactly. And, and one other thing that it just raises, I think, an important discussion around reparations, um, because once you, be, you know, there, there are, you know, one thing that we learned from this film is that there are three things that don't happen randomly. One are voting districts. The other one is economic red lines. And the third one is highways, right? That does not happen randomly. You look at the map and you're like, well, that's really interesting. It is all for a particular racialized capitalist reason. Um, and knowing that now, I really encourage people to think about what reparations, what a repair scheme actually looks like, given the fact that we know uh, what has happened. And it has all been intentional. None of it is by accident. And none of it is like, well, they're winners and losers. Sorry that you guys lost this time. But if you have a dream, maybe you'll win next time. It doesn't work that way. Yeah. I'm so glad you brought that up, Vince. Um, it, the film really illustrates and makes important points uh, about the speed with which this country simply abandoned reconstruction, the efforts um, to remunerate uh, those individuals uh, who found themselves uh, penniless um, with increasing racial animosity in the South. And I'm wondering, because this film is not only to educate, but to raise questions, what are some ways in which this country can remunerate those um, from whom it stole? And, and I'm just so glad that you raised the very important and crucial point uh, that the only reparations it paid, aside from the uh, efforts of General Sherman in Georgia, were, were to remunerate white slavers who had had their property, our ancestors, uh, taken from them. Uh, whoever wants can answer this one. Emily and Sarah, you go first. Uh, what, what real what reparations would look like, Jeff? This, this is, is definitely your this question. Is, this is your life's work. Yeah. I mean, I, no. I will just say, let me, I will just say that this film, we see this film as an argument as from, from beginning to end for reparations. You know, with that, it it, it doesn't it, it, yeah. it wasn't intended to be that. That isn't what was on my mind when I was making this presentation. And it wasn't on my mind as we were traveling around the country filming. But if you look at this film and you ask yourself, is there a justification for reparations? At the end of this film, you got to kind of be saying, yeah, I think we need to talk more about it. And, and I think that, uh, that that is part of the power of knowing history. And it's part of the reason why George Orwell was saying, if you control the past, you control the future. So if you look at Tulsa, Oklahoma today, 
and the devastation of the Greenwood neighborhood, the poverty there, the fact that the only black owned building on Greenwood Avenue is the, is the Vernon AME church. And you see that. And if the Tulsa massacre has been erased from our history books, no one knows it ever happened, then the conclusions you will reach about why that poverty is there will be conclusions that are wrong because you didn't know about the incredible wealth that was just devastated there. And so knowing this history is a revolutionary act. And I think Sarah has said that. And the reason is that if you know the history, you will reach different conclusions about why things exist as they do today. And so the beauty of HR 40, in my view, is do I have ideas about what reparations would look like? You damn right I do. But so what? I'm a criminal defense lawyer. I'm not an economist. I, I'm not somebody that, that knows how to get an economy, you know, to build an economy and get it back running. I got some ideas, but so what? That's why HR 40 has a commission to study the issue, not to study whether reparations are necessary, to study the issue and make specific reparatory proposals to Congress. And so if I have my ideas and I think they're good, I get to take them to this commission and say, here's what I think you should do. And somebody else might say, Jeff, that's stupid. Here's the thing you should really do. And it's that kind of discussion and that kind of investigation that will bring us based on our true history to what I think would be really interesting solutions um, going forward. And the last thing I want to say about it is this is not about making good policy going forward, like build back better, fine, wonderful. That ain't reparations. Reparations are guided toward the community that was impacted. And it is a reckoning with what happened to that community, both in the past and continuing until today. And so doing that, at the same time you are doing other good policy measures is the way that we have to go. I 100% agree. And, um, you know, and for folks at home at, to get deeper into the reparations piece, um, do check out um, our Activist Files podcast because we had a wonderful conversation with Marbray Stolly Butts of Law for Black Lives and Dr. Ron Daniels. Um, who is uh, Black World for the 21st Century, also former executive director of CCR. And I think, you know, just to touch on the point, I mean, and it's amazing how much this is captured in this film. I think for folks who are really thinking like, what do we need to push for? What do we need to do with this information? I would encourage folks um, to go to the Movement for Black Lives website where they have a tremendous toolkit on, on reparations. And I'm not gonna say the whole thing, but there are a couple of things that as you reflect on this film, um, you should be thinking about. One of them is um, that reparations includes identifying the harm that was done. And I think this film um, does an outstanding job touching the surface of the harms that have happened. And I think in ways that are eye-opening to folks. Another piece of reparations is cessation and non-repetition, which is the point that we're in right now, that we need to stop what's happening. And then we also need to ensure through policies, practices, and behaviors that the harm doesn't continue. Compensation is just one part of the reparatory, uh, reparatory scheme. I know people, when they think reparations, they think money, but y'all should be remembering that the reason why though you think that is because the right wants you to think that. As long as we start talking about money, everybody's gonna be, hell no, they're not taking my money. But it is a, a very clear part of how you make of people and their descendants home, whole. And then lastly is satisfaction and rehabilitation and satisfaction I wanna focus on, which is asking the question, what is the state of, what does black America see as I feel that this is a move in the right direction? Not what white people think, not what the rich folks think. This is about what black people think. And, um, you know, I, th I think it's just a, a nice, corollary for people to think about as they're thinking about next steps from this great film. That's one of the most important things you just said is that what do black people think 
is the repertory path. This is not for white America to say, we're the ones that did it to you. So let us decide what it is that you need. That's the reason this commission, I think as it is designed will be majority, the majority of the people will be uh, of black heritage. And, uh, and, and I think that the concept of, oh, this is taking away from someone to give to someone else. And that's really not true. Um, this history that we've talked about, that history in Charleston, South Carolina with those fingerprints on those bricks, that was stolen from everyone in America. And if you see this film, white, black, green, blue, or brown, the next time you're in Charleston, South Carolina, you will be looking at the buildings in a way that you did not look at them before. And so again, it's just the, the power of knowing your history changes the way that you analyze what we're doing and what we need to do. And, and just on this topic, the last thing I wanna say is right now, one in five black people in America live in poverty. What would it look like if it was one in 50? And I don't mean in the black community, I mean, in every other community in America, what would it look like if our property rate was one in 50? Every other community in America would be thriving more than they are now because it really is a movement and a tide that will lift all boats. This is going to be better for everyone. All of us are going to benefit from this kind of justice. So uh, it, it is not a matter of a zero sum game. This is something very different. I couldn't agree with you more. Um, but as you mentioned, there were perhaps at least two prongs to a reparatory scheme. One would be uh, monetary and the other would be uh, a cessation of current practices and policies. And that's where I'd like to turn to the discussion if that's all right. The film makes the very critical and important point that America was founded on white supremacy. To some that may be an outlandish claim to us with lived experiences or who know our history or those who perhaps uh, can learn something from the film, it doesn't surprise us at all. You go into the film, Jeffrey, discussing uh, the beginnings of the American police state, citing to uh, the initial role of police as on fugitive slave patrols. I'm wondering if you think that police have a role to play in a modern anti-racist society, if their original purpose was to perpetuate the institution of chattel -based, uh, race based chattel slavery. Uh, is it time to abolish the police? I think it's important to distinguish between the institution of policing and individual police officers. I don't know if you read the news the other day about the black woman that put her body between a, a quote unquote suspect and a white police officer that was beating him, pushed him back physically, told him to stop, reported him to her superiors and got his ass arrested. And now she's taking all kinds of shit. Don't come to me and tell me that that woman doesn't care about constitutional policing and non-racist policing in our communities because she put her life on the line. She clearly cares. The distinction is individual police officers who are trying to do the right thing versus the institution of policing. And the institution of policing in America, in my view, is broken beyond repair. Individual police officers, I don't believe, are going to be able to turn the tide on the institution as it exists. So I believe we have to completely reimagine policing. I don't believe you can eliminate police officers tomorrow. I've been a criminal defense lawyer for 40 years, and there are times when people do things and you will need someone to respond, sometime to respond by being armed. 
because it's an incredibly violent world that we live in. And so I'm not ready to say, get rid of the police tomorrow. What I am ready to say is, and I'll use Seattle as an example, there's a huge homeless problem in Seattle. And the mayor is saying part of the reason we're having all these confrontations is we don't have enough police officers. That's bullshit. That's just <clears throat> saying, let's, let's solve this problem with a solution that is completely ignorant about the history of why the problem developed in the first place. And so if you really wanted to solve the problem, you would go into the $150 million budget for a police department in a city like Seattle and say, 75 million of that is going somewhere else. And it's going into services that will help the people that we are trying to lock up so we don't want to look at them. It will help them improve the conditions in which they live and give them a different way to go forward. So for me, the struggle is not, the, the, the question is not, can you save policing in America? I think the question is, how does policing have to radically change in America in order for us to live the lives that we would like to live? And a foundational issue there is the amount of money that we spend on policing. Um, you know, if somebody is, I, I would like to imagine a society where when someone is having alcohol and drug problems, and they have a weapon and they're acting violently, we can respond without the threat of violence or without using violence to that person. And we can certainly do things that will greatly reduce, if not eliminate, the instances where somebody is acting that way. But I believe, I'll put it like this, I believe in evil. And I think it's a thing that exists in human society, evil. And I think there are people who will try and do things that are evil. And so I wanna make sure that any society that I live in, to the extent that there are people doing policing, they are doing it in an incredibly limited basis on an incredibly limited number of things. And we can determine how many police we need by first fixing our society and then asking ourselves, how many police do we need as opposed to thinking we will fix our society by just having more police and making more things crimes and arresting more people. Because we have kind of a 300 year history of doing that, a laboratory experiment, and it hasn't worked. Can I build on that? I, you know, I've just been sitting here thinking about this, not with my um, filmmaker hat on, but with my criminal defense lawyer hat on, because like Jeff, I'm also a, a criminal defense lawyer. And I will say that, um, you know, 99% of the crimes that get prosecuted where I end up defending somebody for breaking the law are, are economic crimes, not mm -hmm. violent crimes. And and I, I think it's important because you know what Jeff's talking about is having someone there in in to protect uh, you in a violent situation. But you know that's not what our law enforcement does most of the time. They're you know propping up certain economies at the expense of other economies, right? Where they're penalizing that you know, and also what the police are doing is they're enforcing laws that are passed by legislators, you know, who decide what the crimes are and, you know, and how and what the penalties are for those crimes. So I, I don't really think we could talk about policing in a vacuum, you know, how many, you know, should we abolish the police? Should we defund the police? You know, the, 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 the police, it's, it's like one part of a, a much larger organism which is our criminal justice system, which is in the business of catching people, punishing people, and profiting off of it. Right. So I think I think we do ourselves a disservice when we when we point to the police and we say this is the problem. 
because it's 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 a much bigger systemic problem and those are just that's just the enforcement mechanism of that larger system and if i can if i can follow that up for a second uh i think there was a study out of memphis tennessee my hometown over three or four years they saw the number of homicides go down at the same time the number of police were going down and they couldn't figure out oh well, we don't like these statistics because these statistics seem to be saying something different. And I can't remember the reporter's name, but 1974 in the New York Times, a reporter did this huge article. And he said, one of the things that is coming clear is that uh, there is not necessarily a connection between police and lowering crime. And the police don't want that kind of investigation done. And one of the ways you can see that is that in 2019, when the FBI started asking for uh, data from police departments on violent crime and violent response, I think it was something like 27% of police departments that responded voluntarily. They don't wanna give the data on what they do and the impact that it has, because I think they understand, you know, once again, that concept of an educated uh, uh, citizenry in a democracy. If people actually knew, then they'd be saying, why is New York City spending $4.7 billion in one year, 2017, on policing? Yeah, this is gonna be a problem Angelo, as to, uh, to why you shouldn't have three criminal defense attorneys on a panel, <laughs> I'm, I'll jump in. Here. Um, but I, you know, and and, and I, I I echo I think everything that's that's been said, and I kind of want to ratchet it up just a little bit. Uh, the New York, I'm sorry, the Washington Post just came out with a study. Um, you know, as as Jeffrey was saying, police departments do not comply with their statistics. They don't know. They don't want you to know what's going on, and so it's up to the citizenry and the and the the the, uh, the media to be able to pull that stuff together but they just came out with a report highest number of shootings since the new york times uh, since the washington post has been keeping them i think it's 1055 people um, shot by the police in 2021 and i think the i mean there are a couple of things that are important and i think sarah i totally agree that um the police is not the problem it is a problem it is a manifestation of the problem it is also a manifestation of the problem that has been the key welcoming uh point to the carceral state for uh black people for indigenous people and for people of color um i would add to that um the immigration system as well but because it is a, a key touch point it, it it has to be and i know you're not disagreeing but it has to be addressed in in a in a more concrete way and i think i would put it this way if everybody on this zoom call um we're going to sit down together and to say you know how would we if the goal is security security for our people what's the best way for us to be able to ensure that to make sure that it thrives and none of us would say i have a great idea you remember those these fugitive slave patrols we had a couple of years ago let's just bring that back oh no you know what let's bring back the the mob that we used to have um you know suppressing uh Union activists, that seemed to work. That's going to keep it. None of us would do that. So we're trapped in the piece that it is, it's really clear in the film that the idea that criminalization is the problem is, is, is we're, we're solving for criminalization and not for crime. We're solving for, um, for uh, yeah, criminalization and not, and, and not the crime. And if we were solving for criminalization, we would stop criminalizing. And if we were solving for safety, it wouldn't be the police. So yeah, I'm totally down with this, with a visionary idea of imagining what our communities would look like if they were secure and not policed. That's, I think that's, that's worth us talking about. Uh, you I know, one thing I always no, please, say, go I just want to say this quickly. Uh, using drug dealing as an example. Do you think that's an easy job? There's supply, there's demand, there's security, there's transportation, there's lost product. There are the same kinds of things in any other business that are there. People are like, oh, you know, you're a drug dealer, you're like, you're, you're lazy. It's like bullshit. 
talk to somebody who's trying to make a living that way about what it's actually like. And it's hard work. If I can give the person who's willing to do that hard work another job that will pay them so that they can live a life you know, that, that is rewarding, do you think they're really going to want to go out at two in the morning and stand on a street corner and meet a guy in a car somewhere? It just doesn't work that way. So when Vince is saying, what would make us secure? It's addressing the things that make us not secure in a way not to take them away and put them in a hole, but in a way where the person doesn't have to behave like that anymore. Will that work for every single person? Of course not. But will it work for the vast majority of people? Of course it will. And here's the thing. We've never tried it. We have never tried it. So there is no, uh, uh, you can't say it won't work because it's just never been tried. I'd say Reagan and the CIA had a pretty uh, adept handle on the drug trade, but uh, we don't have to go into that. Um, I think one of the very true things that you mentioned is we've never actually tried, well, aside from the brief period of reconstruction, imagining or reimagining what public safety, particularly for black people would look like in this country. There's an incredibly moving clip of Dr. Martin Luther King in the film in which he asserts that the gains made by the civil rights movement of the 1960s cost this country nothing. The economy benefits from integration. Voting rights place no strain on the nation's coffers. It's when you get down to the nitty gritty feeding the poor, housing the unhoused, and providing true equal economic opportunity for all citizens, but particularly it's black ones who have suffered most at the hands of our white supremacist country where the rubber really meets the road. And these are right. questions that I sit with and that inspire me. And I hope that this film inspires everyone too. Uh, I want to ask uh, Emily and Sarah, particularly uh, what you hope um, this film that you made will, will inspire in people and bring about uh, a, a change in social justice. Um, well, we hope that this film does for audiences what Jeff's presentation did for us the first time that we saw it, um, which is to say, ch change the way that, that people look at the world, change the way that they interact with the world. Um, once you have learned some of this history and, you know, and Jeff's presentation is really just a primer, you know, it, it, yeah. it, it can get you interested in history and then you can go out and look for more of it. It's not, there's no way in two hours you can tell the whole story of, of anti-Black racism in America. Um, but it really, you know, Sarah and I have always been looking for a way to, to be able to, to be anti-racist, to be able to be a, effective activists in the world. Um, and that's, and it's, it's a challenge, you know, and, and we've, 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 we've always, uh, you know, tried to come up with new and different ways to do that. Um, after we saw Jeff's presentation for the first time, we were like, wow, this is, this is what we've been looking for. This is fine. This is a way to bring this information in this condensed way to a large public. This is a way to jumpstart these conversations that this country is so desperate for that we've been so desperate to have, you know, these are, this is, Finally, there's there can be a tool book, right, or or at least a jumping off point um, to enter into this because it's not um, it's very it's it's uh, people are frightened to to wade into this, you know. Um, they're on, they're frightened of being uncomfortable. They're frightened of doing something wrong, you know. Um, and and the way that Jeff brings this, uh, particularly white people, um, but the way that Jeffrey brings this history, you know, and talks about it being stolen from all of us, you know, is such a is such a a, a, a welcoming in, you know. Um, we like to say that that this this film is not a, a calling out; it's a calling in. You know, it's it's a, it's a hopefully it's a it it makes it easier for people um, because of Jeff's generosity um, and his willingness to show his own vulnerability, um, and you know, and the fact that Jeff wasn't taught this, Jeff didn't know this. Jeff had to go out and find this information for himself. It was you know it was stolen from him just as it was stolen from from the rest of us. Um, that this could really be be, be a way to, to to bring people into this conversation and into, into thinking about these issues that we've been talking about th throughout this last hour um, that they wouldn't have had otherwise. And I think when Emily when Emily says people, when she says make it easier for people, I think she means white people, right? She 
bringing well i mean not, not entirely i mean yes white people but i but i think that that it's it's I mean, this film is for everybody. I, I think black and brown audiences come to this film and they learn and they don't, this history is not something that any that anyone has heard before. And people have said to us, oh, don't you worry that maybe this film is preaching to the choir. Um, and this film has no choir in a sense because no no one knew, even if, if you'd heard of Tulsa, you'd heard of it as, as a race riot um, and you heard the 35 people were killed, right? I mean, that, so, so maybe some people had heard about Tulsa and, and maybe some other people had heard more, but. You know, it's it's true that when I talked about the discomfort, I was I was pro primarily talking about white discomfort. But I think that this is a conversation that needs to happen among white people, among black people, among white and black people together. Um, and which is why we all think that it was crucial that this film was made as a collaboration of white and black people, um, because, you know, it, it's I mean, these are the conversations that we had as we traveled across the country in, in a van. These, you know, they're. They're, they're not easy. And, 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 and Jeff has said this, you know, it's like, you're going to make mistakes. You're going to say the wrong thing. You know, you're, you're going to, um, you're going to be uncomfortable, but that's, but that's part of, that's part of learning, you know, and that's part of growing. Growing is always a little bit uncomfortable um, and it's not easy, but that we should all, you know, um, embrace this because it's, it liberates all of us um, in order to, you know, I mean. I'm, I'm going to get surgery on Friday. They're going to cut open my arm for the second time in four months and take an Achilles tendon from a cadaver and put it in to replace a ruptured tendon and put a hole in the bone in my arm and put a pin in to hold it in. That shit's going to hurt, but I'm going to do it because I know that on the other side of the pain, it's going to be better. And that's, that's what we're talking about. It's like, yes, this may be difficult, but on the other side of the pain and discomfort, it will be better. And I just want to say one word <clears throat> about Sarah and Emily, because, you know, they, they were raised in an anti-racist family by anti-racist parents. And <clears throat> I certainly knew that when I knew their name and and, you know, the people I'm talking to about Sarah, who is she? Is she the real deal? I'm hearing great things. I see the movie that they made about their father. And so, you know, those were all wonderful things. But there is a difference between talking about being an anti-racist ally and walking that talk. Sarah and Emily came to me and said, this is your work. This is your film. We don't want any ownership in this. You own it completely. And that's the reason that the Who We Are project has funding because all the money that Sony Pictures Classics paid for the distribution rights to the film goes to the Who We Are project. They came to me and said, <clears throat> you know the story you wanna tell. You have final editorial control over what goes in or what comes out. And people, as we were going forward, are telling me, Jeff, are you sure? Do you have this in writing? That's not the way these things work. Are you sure you own the film? And I'm like, I don't know what the fuck you're talking about, but I know Sarah and Emily, and I know what they said to me, and I know how we're operating together. And so it wasn't me, do Emily edited this film. And Sarah will tell you, neither me nor Sarah knows how she did it. It was an incredible job of editing, but we trusted each other and came to work together with a common goal. So it wasn't one person deciding what goes in and what comes out. It was all of us talking together and making those decisions. I do want to, I, I did want to, I'm sorry, Angelo. I did want to pick up back to something you said about, uh, you know, about Mark, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and getting the gains at bargain rates and what um, what it's going to cost for it to move forward. Um, because I, you know, I that to me was one of the most profound, you know, Jeff, when, when Jeff gives his presentation, even before we made a film out of it, you know, that's part of his, those quotes are part of his presentation. And um, I remember seeing that that clip for the first time the first time I heard Jeff talk and I've thought about it a lot since and I think um yes absolutely there is a there's a there's there's a cost and a big cost to moving forward 
but there's a bigger cost in not doing it. Um, and I don't think that's adequately captured by that King quote, right? I think we're paying that cost now, we're paying it every day. And we have a country that um, is, has, has, you know, our country is like a big open wound. <laughs> And you know, from the original sin of slavery in this country, and um, it, it is a wound that has never healed. And not knowing this history, not reckoning with this history, is 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 such a vastly more tremendous cost than actually dealing with it. Um, and I think that the cost that we pay in dealing with it. Um, is you know is is worth the reward. I think the benefit is far greater than whatever that will cost us because you know being able to finally deal with this and lift everybody up because I do think lifting all boats lifts all boats. You know, um, getting us to a place where we can lift everybody up and 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 free ourselves from the ignorance that perpetuates so much of the systemic injustice that we face um, is something I, I, I think we, I would pay any price for that. Poignantly put, who we are, chronicle of racism in America. Suffice to say, I hope that the film will help explain uh, why we as black people in America demand an accurate and honest accounting of US history. The truth that truly is a prerequisite to truth and reconciliation. Thank you to our listeners, to our interpreters and transcribers, to our partners and team. We are thrilled to work with Roco Films and the film platform for the screening. Follow us on CCR, the Center for Constitutional Rights. Stay tuned for more programming this month, throughout the year, and feel free to get involved. Thank you all for a terrific discussion and even better film. <laughs>